sort of. Hey guys, it's Ted Bogert. Welcome back to The Ted Show. I've got an in-person interview today. I love this. We are doing a series on Black History Month and why we should celebrate it here on The Ted Show. And I am blessed enough to call this lady a dear, dear, dear Aww. friend. She's amazing. Uh, she's hilarious. She keeps me in stitches. Uh, but she has this great history. We're going to learn about that and we're going to get her input uh, on what the big deal is about Black History Month, because y'all, it's a big deal. Uh, welcome, Annette Hampill, to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to see you. Yay, happy to be here. We've laughed a lot before we went live. <laughs> yeah. uh, serious topic, but uh, there are still some things and stories. Uh, Annette's going to share some of that. And we're also doing this as part of a Citrus Club initiative. Uh, Annette is on the board. We're fellow board members, support a governor. And we have, uh, we're focusing, Annette and I are going to take the charge along with a few other people like Sherlet, Michael Moore, and we're going to bring DE&I to the Citrus Club. So I can't wait for that. I can't wait. All right. Welcome. So before we went live, I told you that they love origin story. They want to know a little bit about you. Um, and I told you, don't say I was born and now I got a gym. We got to, <laughs> we got to do a little in between there. Okay. Uh, so give them a little bit of uh, your history. Okay. I'm Annette. Thank you so much for having me on your show, Ted. Um, I was born. Um, that was in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, and now I do currently own a gym. That's my profession. That's what I do now. Um, but a little bit about my history that at least ties into Black History Month, aside from being a Black woman. Um, I went to a private school in Oklahoma City and um, in middle school. And they did not have a Black History class. Uh, they didn't talk about Black History Month. There was none of that. So my mom started a Black History Month. We did sort of a play. It was something that we put on for the parents and they really embraced it. And I, I went all the way back to middle school because I think this is my first um, encounter with knowing that Black History Month wasn't something that everyone celebrated. Um, and so this school celebrated and I feel like it was well received. But then uh, there was a writing contest in my seventh grade year, that was sixth grade, in my seventh grade year, and I won. Well, the winner was supposed to get their picture in the paper and their story in the paper, and the headmaster said that we weren't going to do the contest anymore. So did you, did you, and if you've ever met her mom, you don't want to cross Dr. Pamela. She was on fire. Um, she, was, <laughs> she was, I can only imagine, I feel almost bad for the people who made that decision. Um, but did you, when, when you heard that, did you have a concept of the why or did you just kind of let it go? Like, did you understand why that was happening or did your mom and you have a conversation? Um, what was, cause it stuck with you. You yeah. remember it. That's, yeah. that's what these vividly. moments are vividly. Right. So did you know at that moment, all right, this is definitely something to do with the fact that I'm a black girl. I didn't know that until after my mom and her equally on fire mother had a conversation <laughs> and came to the school to talk to the headmaster. I just thought, oh, they're not doing it anymore. Because of course I come home from school and I tell my mom, well, my, my story, I won, but my story isn't gonna be in the paper. So they came to the school and lit a fire and then my story got published Imagine in the paper. That. <laughs> It's interesting to me because I think those are the small moments before we went live that you that we talk about that make an impact. You remember that. Mm -hmm. You remember when you've been discriminated against. You remember when you've felt disenfranchised and you 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 remember the negative. You don't focus on it, but it certainly right. helps mold how you move forward. Exactly. Uh, but you had another incident. Too. Yeah. So same school. I tried out for cheerleading and I well, humbly, I was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Humbly and, is right next to her picture in the dictionary. <laughs> that's for sure. And I didn't make the squad. So mom and grandma were right back up at the school in the headmaster's office. And the headmaster actually said to my mother and grandmother, she simply doesn't fit the image of a crusader. I mean, and is at he that still point, living? <laughs> because Dr. He Pam, Dr. your mom was not. I mean, I don't know how the guy's still breathing. I don't either. <laughs> but it was... Um, at that time, after that incident, I realized, okay, there is a separation. Here. Oh, and also this was a K through 12 school. There were six black students and I was, I was obviously one of the six, but five of them were siblings. So what was, did you, two black so siblings. those are the, that's, those are defining moments. Um, did you, 
did you feel after we, after you went there, did you feel like you wanted to leave the school? What were you feeling? Did you feel insecure? Um, or did you just figure out how to push through? Did what, what was the coping skills like there? Cause you still had to go to school right? and you knew you were going to a school where the headmaster didn't think you belonged. Right. Basically my image was off. Your image. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a little darker than a little darker were. than the, image um, but did you just go to school, hold your head high? Was it hard? Was it a challenge? What were you thinking and feeling? As a seventh, eighth grade girl, it was hard going to school and continuing to hold my head high when I saw the other girls in their cheerleading uniforms. Yeah. And they, in their, I mean, they thought that I should have been a cheerleader. I was good. They didn't understand what was going on. Um, but, you know, the parents knew. So that was difficult. But then we moved to Florida and I did make the cheerleading team. And life was very different when I got to Florida in public school. It was much more I want to say integrated. It wasn't the 60s, but there were a lot more black people and brown people yes. in my school. So, um, yeah, I, and I, I, I credit my mom and grandmother for that, um, helping me be able to hold my head high. They instilled a great deal of confidence in all of us. So I think it's important that when you have that support, because the support begins at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can imagine, though, it's still that's a very hormonal time for any teenagers, boys right. or girls. So they're emotional. You're going through changes. You and then to be shot down like that and then realize that the only reason is because of the skin, color of your skin right. is really got to be an eye-opening yeah. moment. So when you got here, you you got through school. And then what did you do afterward? What did what was your journey to owning the gym? So my journey to, whew, goodness, um, that's a long journey. <laughs> Give me some uh, bits and pieces okay. of the journey. There was... There was some college, there was some dropping out of college, there was some going back to college. And then I met Nate and he and I got married and he was a gym enthusiast. And so it's actually because of his passion for CrossFit that we opened the gym. So let's talk about Nate. Uh, you have an interesting perspective, I think, since we are talking about Black History Month. You are married to a white man. I am. So I, I'm fascinated by how that was accepted on all sides. Um, was it a challenge in, I mean, I think I know the answer. Was it a challenge in your family? Was it a challenge in his family? Was it a challenge among your sphere or was it just accepted as normal and that you just love each other? You're a human being and he's a human being. What, what right. was the process like? So Nate was always accepted into my family. My family has loved him since we were in high school. We, we dated in high school, but we didn't get married until post college. But, um, my grandma even used to have a joke. She would say, listen, we love Nate. If Nate and his wife are coming to Thanksgiving, I'll make sure you know so that you don't feel uncomfortable when they're here. <laughs> That's how much love my family that. loves Nate. Yeah. And they have always loved him that much. So there, it was not, our race was not an issue for my family. And for years, we've been married 17 years and for probably 14 of those years, I didn't think that it was a problem for his and not that it is now, but he did say that his family expressed some concerns and your children are going to have some issues and it's going to be different. Um, and I was happy that he shared that with me because I'd like to know if that's what they feel like. But for the most part, no, not within our family. It's, it's, have you experienced when you began dating again, you got married in the last 17 years, have you experienced people giving you the look or making you feel or trying to make you feel uncomfortable because it's a white man and a black woman? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that happens mostly when we go back to Oklahoma for mm -hmm. family gatherings. He and I will walk into a restaurant, we'll be holding hands or we'll be sitting at a table together. Even at the hostess stand, we've had people say, are you all together? And we look at each other and look at the hands that we're holding <laughs> and we're like, yes. We're together. Mm -hmm. And then they bring the check and they say, is it together or separate? I'm like, this Isn't person who I'm sharing food with, it's probably going to be together. Um, so that that has been the majority of it when we are outside of, you know, our little bubble. And that doesn't mean that discrimination and racism doesn't happen everywhere. We both know it does. It does. But I've only experienced it in those moments. And I may be hypersensitive to going back to my home state and feeling well, that. Well, but I think you can feel that i've experienced a little yeah. bit of that because when stacy and i go out they think oh she's with her her gay best friend because of the way i dress no it's the truth and so that i can't tell you how many times they will say together <laughs> checks or separate i mean yeah um 
talk about uh, black let's talk about black history month let's so do you celebrate it and if you do what do you do specifically during this month to bring awareness or to celebrate um that's such an interesting question i'm so glad you asked it because before we got on camera and you mentioned that question i was thinking my goodness in 40 years, I don't think I've actually celebrated Black History Month. I know it's a thing because, you know, it's a thing and I'm a Black person. I feel like it has become even more important to me over the past couple of years because I feel like, I mean, everybody knows what this country has been going through. And so it's it's made it more important to me to highlight it. It's the opportunity to be on your show Understood. today. Um, so I don't know that there are ways to celebrate it. What I do appreciate is seeing the outpouring of major companies celebrating Black people, Black Americans, and the contributions that they've made to this country. And I think that's such an important thing to do. I'm not sure why it sometimes makes people angry. Uh, I'm not sure why conversations about race make people so angry. That's not true. I do understand why the conversations make people angry. I hope we can get to a place where we have these conversations and we're so excited to learn about other cultures and other people's experiences, as opposed to immediately feeling like you're being called a racist or that you're accusing someone of being racist. It's Because we talked a little bit about that before we went live. It It is an interesting place to be. One of the reasons why I love to do shows like this is because I have no problem asking the questions that other people might feel um, uncomfortable. And until we get past that discomfort on both sides, if there's we're a side, never gonna go. we're, the, the dialogue's never gonna progress. You have to be able to know that I can ask you a question. Like I asked the question, I shared this, I think with Charlotte the other day. Um, I asked you all, should I say African-American or black? Mm -hmm. Now I have learned that my Caribbean American, Haitian American friends prefer black. It's overall encompassing. But as you know, the term has been African American. That's the buzzword. That's what everybody says. Mm -hmm. And then I have people that will raise their hands and go, I'm not from Africa. Right. So I feel like until I got more comfortable, it wasn't even something I'd ask. I would have just put African American because I know that's right. what is accepted. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of conversations people need to say, hey, Annette, what's your preference? Right. And you not think, not that you ever would, oh God, you idiot white person. Why <laughs> are you asking this dumb question? And you answer it because that is the only way we can move it's the, the only needle way. and move the progression. Right. Because uh, if we don't, and we're all afraid to talk and have and I mean, have an intelligent and respectful conversation, mm -hmm. uh, then yeah, the moving the needle is just almost impossible. Impossible. And we can't, we can't grow that way. We can't. So let's talk a little bit about the world. Cause you mentioned that. Okay. Um, what do you feel like? Uh, what's your feeling on where we're at now? What do we need? Are we, did we take a bunch of steps back? Um, are we back on track? Because if you listen, if you see anything in the news, uh, you're seeing a lot more hate groups out. I just talked about this with Judge Perry. Yeah. There's a lot more hate groups coming out. Um, and it's interesting to me, they've always been there. Right. It's just become almost more acceptable for that. Yeah. Uh, what are your feelings? Okay. So in my commitment to not looking at how divided we are, but trying to move forward and move the conversation to how we are more alike, that part is very difficult. I think we're in a better, as divided as we are and as hateful as so much speech seems, I think the reason we're in a better place is because it's out there. We're talking about it now. These conversations aren't happening in closed doors with you know a certain sect of people being racist or being bigots in their small groups. Yes. It's out there. People recognize that this is alive and well, and people are talking about it, and people are like that, and people are uneducated and need to be educated. Right. So it's a really hard thing to be positive about, but if we're not talking about it, then That's it's right. just happening and growing and festering in you know, small little sects and small little groups, and that's not healthy. The spotlight on it, as much as I hate hearing the hate The speech, hate stuff, yeah. Uh, the spotlight on it. Um, letting all the roaches come to the light. <laughs> it, it's necessary. It's a exactly. necessary, unfortunately, it's a necessary evil because all, remember guys, you're hearing it more. It doesn't mean it didn't it go there. on just as 
powerful behind the scenes in their minds. Uh, and now that it's out and about and exposed, I feel it gives employers, it gives people, it gives uh, us an opportunity to see what people really represent and see if we really want to align ourselves mm -hmm. with that kind of thinking. And I love how there has been such a um, reaction and, and it, it is oftentimes very decisive mm -hmm. action where something comes out and you realize somebody is a racist or a bigot and right. the they get fired, they get removed from their job. They, uh, we, these lovely things right here, it's not like the, um, God bless him, it's not like the George Floyd's uh, situations haven't ha happened before. I love that you just said that. But the phone, as much as we hate it in the video, that stuff now is out and about and we're holding people accountable for what's going on. So I just, I, I'm, I feel like exactly like you, I can't stand all the negativity but if we don't continue to bring it out and shed light on it, we can't continue to reach people, especially those middle of the road people who think just sitting there is not bad. Right. Uh, and they think being quiet is not bad. And yeah. now there's almost a forced, hey, where are you at? Right. You believe this crap that they're saying or are you going to stand up for our black friends, our LGBTQ plus friends? And silence is the worst. Silence is the worst. If you say nothing, you have taken a stand. I agree. I totally agree. All right. I last question. Okay. Uh, and I didn't prep you for it. Oh dear. She's been nervous the whole time, and you've done phenomenal, by the way. Okay. Um, you really have. <laughs> Thank you. When I say the word hero, who's the first person that comes to mind for you? Mommy. Okay. Well, tell us why. Because <laughs> I adore her. Absolutely love her. She is so amazing, and I don't want it. I don't mean for it to be cliche to say my mom, but as Ted has alluded to, she's quite phenomenal. Um, she has persevered through some of the most difficult things that um, most, a lot of black women have had to go through. She was pregnant with me at 15. Fast forward all these years later, she was the first woman in the state of Oklahoma to get a PhD in engineering. And they have her picture up in Felger Hall, which makes me very, very proud. She is currently caring for her mother in her home who is suffering from early onset dementia um she's she's just she's incredible she she's is. she's my hero she never looks at a problem and thinks that it's too big she's like all right well how do we fix this she never looks at a problem which my husband hates and thinks we can't afford it she's like oh we can pull some resources we can figure uh, this out i love that way of thinking it's <laughs> yeah. it's law of attraction <laughs> we build it they'll totally. come kind of stuff. and she's 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 optimistic she's strong she's powerful she's hilarious um she's she spells hero I love that. See, we have to give kudos, out loud kudos to yeah. the people that mean those kinds of things to us. So thanks for sharing that. All right. So we're done. What's the best way they can reach you, Annette? Not social media. <laughs> Not social media. <laughs> I have no social media, but you can email me at Annette at an affair of excellence.com. I love that. Yes. An affair of excellence. You do so much. It's not just it's not just just the gym, the gym yeah. and not that the gym isn't a lot, <laughs> um, but you you bring so much light up here to the club Thanks, and I'm so, I'm so it's such a blessing Thank to hang you. out. And if you haven't been up here when we're all sitting around and laughing super loud, you are missing You're out. You're missing out. There's tons of laughter. <laughs> it's a good day. That's always it. Always feels good to be around you all. Yeah. That's how you are. Yeah. All right, love you to pieces. Love you. Love Nate Thank too. You. Love mom. Thank we'll see you guys soon. Bye everybody. I have to do this with a different hand. Here we go. <laughs> Bye, everybody.